Okay, gang, welcome to our uh, last uh, video lecture, uh, because when I'm done with this lecture, uh, Professor Adams will be coming back, and you guys will then be moving into cardiovascular physiology. Um, now, when we left off uh, in class, we were talking about enzymes. We were talking about how enzymes are these proteins that act as catalysts, which means they make reactions happen. I showed you some examples of reactions in class. We kind of talked a little bit about um, glycolysis and how that reaction works and how these enzymes act on glucose and start to transform it into different variations of glucose. Um, so ultimately that glucose can be broken down and utilizes ATP. So what we're going to be talking about today is these this idea of these metabolic pathways. So as you can see down here, I have metabolic pathways written. And what I want you to see here is an example of our energy pathways or our metabolic pathways. And what you're going to notice is if we look at the, here, let me get my marker out. If we look at the um, X axis right here, we can see that we're looking at time. So you can see, see six to 10 seconds here, 30 to 60 seconds. And then there's this kind of gap here that goes from uh, 60 seconds to multiple hours, right? And what this graph is showing you is that uh, this is where power or the energy for power is coming from. So for the muscle to uh, contract and do work, we know we need this ATP. Well, we also know that in our skeletal muscle, we have a very small amount of ATP, and we have it inside of these kitty swimming pools. I drew this for you in class, and uh, this is just a pool, right? P-O-O-L. And we know that we have this limited amount of ATP in our muscle, and it's ready for us to use. And that's kind of what this is showing us right here. So I want you to follow my pen and see that we have this storage of pool of ATP and it plummets very, very quickly. So I want you to follow my pen and see how I'm kind of following this orange line right here, right? And if we get down to the bottom here, we can see that that kind of, that kind of, we're kind of done with it after about seven to eight seconds. Um, but you'll see that here, when we have a decrease in ATP, another energy system kind of turns on, and you follow my pen, and it comes here. And as that starts to plummet, you'll see this blue energy system right here start to kind of turn on and take over. And you can see that um, the amount of power that this blue energy system here puts out is very different than the amount of power that we can put out here, right? So if we follow this line over, like let's just make this kind of line do this like this, you can see that it is about half of what we saw here. So what this graph is saying is that we transition into different energy systems. And you can see here we have one energy system, two energy systems, three energy systems, four energy systems, and over here, five energy systems. And all of these energy systems utilize different types of substrates, which means we have carbohydrates, right? You can see that right here. And we have fats. And as time goes on, you can see time here, as time goes on, intensity decreases because this is power, right? So when we first start out with exercise, we have very high intensity, and then it drops, and then it drops, and if you go over here, it kind of drops more, and then as you go over here, it kind of drops even more. Okay, so this is just kind of familiarizing you with what we are really gonna kind of focus on um, over the next few slides, okay? So we're talking about energy pathways, and um, let's get into these energy pathways. Let's start to talk about them. So this is another variation of what I just showed you. And you can see here that we have different um, substrates for each pathway. So let me try to make this make sense for, sorry about that, make this make sense for you. So as I've been saying over and over and over again, we have ATP in the muscle. 
And if you really look at this, you see this yellow line here, if you kind of follow my pen, there's this little yellow sliver. Now let me, let me try to color it in a little bit so you can see it. Okay. That little yellow sliver is how much energy we have stored in the muscle. And once we start to use it, you can see it plummets very, very quickly. But when that energy system plummets, you can see this orange one here. Let me change my marker color so you can follow that a little better. Let me change it to black. This orange one right here starts to rise. And it kind of takes over producing energy, right? So if we run out of the ATP that's in the muscle, well, then we have this second, second energy system here that's going to help kind of create energy once this plummets because we still have to create ATP. So this second energy system is something that we call the phosphagen system, okay? And this phosphagen system, it uses creatine phosphate. So this right here, CRP, stands for creatine phosphate. And it uses something else called creatine kinase. And we know creatine kinase is an enzyme because if you look over here, creatine kinase, I told you in class, if something has an ACE at the end, that means it's an enzyme and it's going to make reactions happen. So we have free ATP in the muscle, right? And that's the equivalent to what I told you guys about that kiddie pool, right? Each muscle has this kind of kiddie pool of free ATP and it's ready to use, but it leaves very quickly as you can see there. Now, once we're out of that ATP, we're going to switch energy systems, right? So I go from this free ATP and I switch to something called the phosphagen system. So it's P H O S P H A G E N. And I'm sorry that looks so bad, but I'm drawing on a mouse, so just give me a break. Um, and this phosphagen system with ATP, these two work together. This lasts us for about, watch, watch my line here. This lasts us for about 10 seconds. You see that? So with the ATP phosphagen system, we have about 10 seconds of energy. And the more intense we use that, the more intense the exercise, the quicker that's going to go. So if we were in our lecture room and I said, everybody stand up, walk to the bottom of the stairs, I want you to sprint up as many flights of stairs as fast as you can and go so hard. Well, this 10 seconds might only last seven seconds because you're using that energy very, very quickly because of the intensity of the exercise. Now, if we look at this third system, okay? So the reason I have this slide, it's, it's a little different than this one, but I, I like the way this one names it and I like how they kind of put these things over it here. So we have our first energy system. Let's just recap. Let me, let me, let me highlight that, okay? Uh, we have the ATP phosphagen system. That's one energy system. Or sometimes this is referred to as the um, ATP creatine system or the uh, creatine kinase pathway. So there's many different names, but just know we have free ATP and we have the phosphagen system. Now, neither of these use oxygen. When we move into the next one, so if we expend these two, right, and we're, we're 10 seconds into exercise and we've used all of that energy, or that ATP. Well, if we want to keep exercising, the body has to keep making more ATP. So what you'll see here is look at this purple line. This purple line starts to rise, which means we're starting to use a lot more of that energy system. And then that purple line will peak, and then that purple line will start to kind of decrease. Now this purple line, this is a glycolysis pathway, okay? And basically how this works is we take glucose into the muscle, that glucose goes through a whole bunch of different reactions, and then we get something called pyruvate. And when we get pyruvate, pyruvate will make lactic acid. 
or lactate, right? And we know that lactic acid is the substance that creates the burning in our muscles when we're exercising at a certain intensity. Now, before we move on, keep in mind that this glycolysis has two pathways. It has an aerobic and it has an anaerobic. And we're going to talk about both of those very, very soon. Oops, let me go back. Sorry, it's getting... Okay, so let me erase this and let's just kind of review again. We have our first pathway, which is, and I'm just going to give you another name for it. This is the ATP PC system or the ATP phosphagen system. And if you said, well, why ATP PC? Because creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine, you can use those interchangeably. It's very, it's very confusing because scientists like to confuse us. Um, but you can see here, phosphocreatine, right? So this is the ATP PC or the ATP phosphagen system. This is one, okay? Now in glycolysis, we have two separate pathways. We have an anaerobic, I'm just gonna put AN, which means there's no oxygen, and we have an aerobic, and our aerobic means that we have lots of oxygen, okay? So that would be two more pathways. And then when we're done burning sugar, because we know glucose and glycolysis has to do with sugar, sorry about that, then we move into fatty acids, right? You can see this right here, fatty acids. And this is the oxidative system. And this is where we're using a lot of oxygen and we're losing, using a lot of fat and we're creating a lot of energy, but it's at a lower intensity, right? If it's at a lower intensity, then we started way over here, right? So, um, and this is just showing you that it's a mitochondria. And when we have the mitochondria, we make a lot more ATP. Look at all, look at all that ATP compared to this, right? This one only has one, this one has one, which means these systems don't make a lot of energy, which is why they burn out so fast. Look at how quickly those burn out. The glycolysis pathway, remember there's two of them, there's anaerobic and aerobic. These produce a little more energy. So you can see that this purple line, it goes a little further and we have slightly more ATP. But once we get into aerobic, once we get into the aerobic metabolism, this one makes a lot of ATP. Okay, so what I want you to get from this slide is if you look down here again, we can see our energy pathways and we can see that we have our ATP PC system or ATP phosphagen system, right? Um, oops, my mouse is very sensitive today. So we have our first system here. And this is our ATP PC or ATP phosphagen system. And again, this lasts for about 10 seconds, okay? These are two pathways. This is the ATP that's stored in the muscle, and this is the creatine phosphate pathway, and these two work together. Now, these two pathways produce a lot of force. We can get a lot of power from the ATP pathway, and it dies out very quickly. So if we look at the athletes here, what athlete is kind of working for about 10 seconds and then stopping? And if you said the pitcher and the shot putter, well, then you would be right. So these two athletes are primarily performing in these two systems, the ATP PC system. And you can see that they're performing in that those systems because look at the pitcher throws a ball and then he rests. He's done. The muscle contraction is over until the catcher throws the ball back and then he's going to read the catcher's sign and then throw the pitch again. And there's a lot of time in between his contractions. Now, if you look at the female down here, um, she is going to throw the, the shot put and then she's done. So she's basically contracting for about maybe five, four seconds. So these two athletes, they generally perform within this 10 to six to 10 second ratio. And they are primarily using these two pathways, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Now when we get into anaerobic glycolysis and aerobic glycolysis, 
These are the athletes that are using carbohydrates. And I'm going to put CHO for carbohydrates. Okay. Now these athletes can go anywhere from 10 seconds to, let's say, 90 seconds, right? Which means their duration of exercise is a little longer. So these athletes would be like a wrestler, right? Or like a, gym, a gymnast who's doing a routine that might be 90 seconds. Now, their muscle contractions are slightly different than these two people, right? I mean, this is a lot of strength, a lot of power, but you can see that they're moving a little slower, right? Um, and this individual, uh, she's using momentum to help her on the parallel bars, but she's doing a routine that is slightly longer in time. So these two athletes here, the wrestler and the gymnast, when they begin to exercise, they're going to move through this pathway, ATP, PC, they're going to use it. Then they're going to turn on phosphocreatine, and they're going to use it, right? They're going to produce ATP that way. And then they're going to move into anaerobic glycolysis and into aerobic glycolysis. And they're going to produce ATP with anaerobic and aerobic glycolysis. Now, the only difference between these two pathways is this one does not require oxygen, and this one does require oxygen. So you can see that when we use oxygen and we use sugar or fat, you can see that the intensity of exercise goes down, right? This is less intense than this. You can see this one puts out a little more power, right? Because it's higher than this one. And when we get over here, look at how low this is compared to these two. So as intensity of exercise um, drops, we can do exercise for a longer period of time because we're using fuel that will help us do exercise for a long period of time. If the duration of exercise goes for a long period of time, we use these pathways over here, aerobic and fatty acids, right? Um, and fiber dominance of the exercise. So I told you guys that when we use our muscles, we can use either a type 1, a type 2A, or a type 2X, right? You can obviously tell that these, this pitcher and this shot putter, they're using type 2 X's because their contractions are happening very quickly. Okay, so let me clean this slide up a little bit. If I can get to my, there it is. Let me clean it up. So ATP PC system. This one here likes to use type 2X fibers. Those real powerful quick twitch fibers, right? So this is a quick twitch athlete, and this is a quick twitch athlete. Now when we get into, let me change colors, when we get into, um, let's do green. When we get into aerobic glycolysis and anaerobic glycolysis, remember these are carbohydrates, these tend to be type 2A athletes that use more strength. So you can see she's using a lot of strength, and you can see that he is using a lot of strength as well. Now when we get over here to aerobic fitness, we get into aerobic um, metabolism, this is using mostly fat, and look at how long this system can go for. It can go for so long but the intensity has to be really low. So if you look over here at these individuals, well, these are cross-country skiers. They're going to move for a very, very long time, and they're primarily going to be in this pathway. So every athlete is going to use a different type of fiber and use a different type of metabolism. So the first one we're going to talk about here in depth is the ATP PC system, okay? And these two work together as a single system. And if you follow my line down here, this lasts anywhere between zero to 15 seconds. And the only reason I put 15 seconds here, right, because here it has 10 seconds, is because we can train this. We can extend this about five seconds longer if we train the athlete the right way. 
So an athlete that trains in or performs in this position, in these two pathways, predominantly, we can get them to about 15 seconds. All right. So these are power athletes. These are people that use those type 2x fibers a lot. All right. So let's get into that a little bit. So um, when we talk about the ATP PC system, we're talking. Oops. We're talking about high intensity short duration sports right and if i go back here right uh, let me clean this mess up pitching and the shot put is very high intensity and short duration how do we know this is high intensity because this person is trying to throw the ball at 100 miles per hour right that is a power contraction we are doing that um we are we are using those type 2x fibers and exploding to try to get that ball to move as quickly as we can. And the same thing's happening here. She is trying to throw that ball as far as she can uh, on a single contraction. Um, so these are what we call high intensity short duration sports, right? And running can be high intensity, right? If we're sprinting. Swimming can be high intensity if we're sprinting. Cycling can be high intensity if we're, we're sprinting at a, at a high pace, right? So these can all kind of all fit in this ATP PC system, right? Uh, jumping, sprints, disc throws, right? What I just showed you. If somebody's sprinting and jumping over hurdles or pole vaulting, these are all high intensity, short duration. Um, and these events generally last a couple of seconds, right? Um, they could go to a minute, but if they do go to a minute, uh, it generally usually incorporates a lot of strength. So if we go back here, right, this is something that is high intensity, but if it goes a little longer, it's also incorporating strength. Um, so this could go for a minute, right? Um, but they're still using those type 2x fibers and they're using a lot of that um, a lot of this pathway here okay so this is a primary energy system that we call ATP PC right or it's called ATP CP or the phosphagen system right there's all these names for it but uh, just understand that this stands for ATP and this stands for phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate and again this lasts for about 15 seconds so if I were to ask you on an ex exam um, what uh, pathway lasts for 15 seconds? You would say the ATP PC system. Now, the second one, which is the anaerobic glycolysis, this one will come to the rescue once we start to burn out that ATP PCC system. And we call this metabolic flexibility. And what does metabolic flexibility mean? Well, that means that as I'm going through um, these different pathways, my body can shift to a new pathway to keep making ATP. So if I burn out this ATP, then I shift into the creatine phosphate system. And after about 10 seconds, when I burn out that energy system, I shift into the anaerobic glycolysis system. And after I burn this out, I shift into the aerobic glycolysis system. And then once I burn this out, I can shift into the fatty acid or the aerobic system, right? So that's what metabolic flexibility means. It means you do have the ability to switch metabolisms as needed. Um, so once we burn out that ATP PC system, then we shift into aerobic glycolysis. And the, oops, sorry about that. The aerobic glycolysis, depending on the intensity, could be anywhere from 15 seconds to three minutes. Now, what I mean by that is if it's low intensity, then uh, this can go a little longer. If it's high intensity, it can't go that long, right? So it gets a little tricky when we start giving these time frames because it really depends on, let me go back here, it really depends on the intensity of the exercise, right? Um, so what this graph shows us is that this anaerobic system right here it goes for about 10 seconds to 30 seconds. So that's what the graph is showing us. But again, it's not incorporating intensity. It's just giving you kind of a generic representation that says, hey, we get about another 15 seconds with the anaerobic glycolysis, all right? So don't pay too much attention to this. 
um, simply because it depends on intensity. This one is pretty accurate. Okay, so I just want to kind of go over it one more time. Um, so this ATP PC pathway or ATP CP pathway or high energy phosphate system, it, it's so confusing and I apologize for it. Um, this, we're going to talk about the enzyme that plays a role in creating energy once we burn this, uh, this, AT, this ATP that we have. Um, let me get my pen out. Here we go. Um, so creatine phosphate is this really important molecule, but it's also called phosphocreatine, right? And it is stored in the muscle. So you can see it right here, creatine phosphate. And it kind of looks like this. It has a creatine molecule, right? And we'll just put a circle around it because it's a molecule. And it has a phosphate molecule. And essentially what this does is creatine gets the phosphate ready to pass it on to ADP. So when we start exercising and we start creating a lot of ADP because we're using ATP, well, we start to lose energy because we're losing those phosphates. But when we have ADP, circulating in the muscle cell, creatine phosphate will give its phosphate to ADP to create ATP. So that's what creatine phosphate does. And it does it for about five seconds. Because again, when we drop off that ATP, when we're using it for muscle contraction, well, then this phosphocreatine system kicks up and it starts to drop and what it's doing is it's taking creatine phosphate and it's making ATP and I want to show you how it does that so this um, creatine phosphate system this is readily available for use when the 10 seconds worth of ATP is gone okay so when we have this free ATP is gone, the creatine phosphate system or the phosphagen system starts to donate the phosphagen to the ADP. And this basically helps recycle and add the phosphate group back onto ADP. And that's what I just drew for you. Um, it's very fast system, but it does not last long, right? So if you look at this again, this plummets immediately. The phosphocreatine system turns on and then that plummets at about 10 seconds, right? But through training, we can extend that. We can make that happen a little longer. So let's look at this a little more. So here we're talking about that high intensity, short duration exercise. Here is creatine, here is phosphate. And creatine will donate the phosphate to make ATP, okay? Um, this picture down here is a little more uh, complicated. But don't worry about it. I'm going to draw it for you in a moment anyway, so it just makes a lot more sense. We can see here we have phosphocreatine, right? Here's the phosphate. Here's the creatine. And what this picture is showing us is that we need this enzyme. And this enzyme is called creatine kinase, right? You can see it right here, creatine kinase. Creatine kinase will separate the phosphate from the creatine. And creatine kinase will put that phosphate back onto ADP to make ATP. And then what happens is creatine is free to go find another phosphate and bind to that phosphate so that we have more creatine phosphate. So let's go through that one more time. Let me erase this, right? So we have phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate, however you want to say it. And we have this enzyme called creatine kinase. Here it is, creatine kinase. And then here's that phosphocreatine, right? There it is. And when ADP starts to get high in the muscle cell because we're running out of energy, right? Creatine phosphate says, oh, it turns on. It says, oh my gosh, we're running low on energy, right? This is it's waking up, right? Oh, hey, I'm awake. And it says we got to start donating phosphates to ADP to get it back to ATP, 
right? And that's its job. So creatine kinase is going to come over here and separate these two, right? And it's going to take that phosphate and it's going to add it to ADP. And then ADP will then be converted into ATP. Same thing here, creatine phosphate. Okay, we have creatine kinase. We know that's an enzyme that's going to separate these two. And creatine kinase is going to take that phosphate and put it right back over here so that we have ATP. So again, this high energy phosphate system, this is, includes phosphocreatine, and this is very, very accessible and a rapid form of energy resynthesis and energy storage. And here's the reaction that I just explained. Creatine kinase catalyzes the reaction. What does catalyze mean? It means it makes the reaction happen. If we don't have creatine kinase, we can't separate creatine phosphate from each other, right? Phosphocreatine releases inorganic phosphate molecule, right? Because creatine kinase separates those two. And then this phosphate is free to be put back onto ATP, ADP. And this says here that phosphate combines with ADP to form ATP. ATP is used for energy on contracting skeletal muscles. And that's kind of how that short energy system works. And then if you don't really kind of get it and you have to read a little bit, uh, I have this analogy here for you that will help it make a bit more sense. So I said here that the ATP system can be linked to a sprinter relying on a stash of cash in their pocket for a quick purchase, right? ATP PC system, that is a high energy phosphate system, and it's for quick twitch explosive athletes like sprinters. So that's why I put a sprinter here, okay? Um, just as the sprinter needs immediate energy for short bursts of speed, the ATP PC system provides rapid energy for short bursts of intense activity, okay? Um, this is like dipping into their pocket for cash. Muscles tap into the stored ATP. We know that muscles will use that ATP and phosphocreatine for instant energy without needing oxygen, right? So if we go back here, I showed you that this pathway does not need oxygen. And the reason we talk about oxygen is because if we use oxygen for exercise, it takes a little bit of time to get there, right? It takes about a minute to start bringing in oxygen. So where are you getting energy that first minute if there's no oxygen going to the mitochondria? Well, that's why we have these other energy systems because they provide the energy while we're getting the oxygen to where they need to be. Um, so I said here, I said, just as a sprinter, uh, just as their cash runs out quickly, the ATP system exhausts its stores within seconds, requiring replenishment for sustained activity. So now I, in, in class, I kept kind of mentioning that um, when we do exercises that require high intensity, we usually do a one to three ratio. Why do we do a one to three ratio? Because if we, if we sprint for 10 seconds, we want to rest for 30 seconds. And the reason being is because when we rest, this creatine, remember I said once we break down creatine and phosphate, creatine is free. Well, during that rest time, creatine is going to find as many phosphates as it can, and it's going to resynthesize creatine phosphate. So that when we start that next set of sprints after 30 seconds, this whole energy system has been recycled. So that's why we have to rest. And if we don't rest, if we don't rest, then we shift right into this next system, right? If we don't rest and let this recycle, well, then we shift into anaerobic glycolysis and look what happens. It's way less power, which means intensity has to drop, right? When we did high intensity exercise, look at the intensity was way up here, but now it has to drop. And that means that the body has to start slowing down. We can't maintain that intensity because we're using a different type of energy system. Okay, so um, let's kind of go over this now and, and just move a little bit slower, okay? So we have, I'm gonna draw here, we have our X and Y, right? We know on the Y axis we have power. And on the X, we have time. Okay, now we know that uh, we, we already talked about how we have this 
high amount of ATP in the muscle. It's stored there. And once we start exercising, that ATP drops very quickly. And we use it because skeletal muscle is going to use it. And what I mean by dropping is we go from ATP to ADP and then to AMP. And we know that AMP is a very low energy state in the muscle and we never really want to be there. So when we get to this ADP, the creatine phosphate system or the phosphocreatine system, it recognizes that the energy is getting low, so it starts to turn on. And it's going to come up like this, and it's going to make some more ATP, and then it's going to drop. So what the creatine phosphate system is doing, I'll say creatine phosphate, is it starts to make ATP, and it makes ATP, and it makes ATP for a little bit, and then it starts to drop, and we get ADP, and we get AMP. And the reason it's dropping is because it no longer has the ability to generate ATP without help. So it's going to need help, which means it's going to shift into another metabolic system. So we know that this is about 0 to 10 seconds that this is occurring, right? And we know that there's also no oxygen. This is not using any oxygen whatsoever. And we know when this system turns on, when we have ADP, right, which is a low energy source, when we have that in the muscle cell, creatine and phosphate, it's going to recognize that. It's going to say, hey, look, hey, look, right? It's like a comic book, like it's shocked. Hey, look, at it's low energy. And it's going to say, hey, creatine kinase. And creatine kinase is over here. It's an enzyme. And we know creatine kinase is like a pair of scissors. And creatine kinase is going to say, yeah, what's going on, guys? How, what, what's, what's happening? And phosphocreatine is going to say, look, look at ADP. It's, it's low energy. We need help. So creatine kinase will say, okay, I, I got you. And creatine kinase will basically, um, it will cut creatine and phosphate and separate the two of them. All right, it's an enzyme that will cut creatine and phosphate and separate them. And then this phosphate will be donated to ADP to make ATP. And that's what's happening. And then this creatine, this creatine will float away and try to find another phosphate and bind to it so that we have creatine phosphate again. So that's how we're making energy in this pathway. So it's really important that you understand that. And you also understand that if there's no rest, if we're exercising and there's no rest whatsoever, then we have to shift into another pathway. And what is that pathway? Well, I'm going to draw it now and we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Where did, where did, my, where did it go? Uh, oh, there it is, sorry. <laughs> um, well, then we're going to shift into aerobic, I'm sorry, anaerobic glycolysis. Here we go. There we go. Okay. So what this looks like is now once we get to this ADP, right, we got low energy again. I'm just going to write low energy. The anaerobic glycolysis pathway starts to turn on. So look at here it comes. It's making ATP. It's making ATP. It takes over from the creatine phosphate system and then it starts to drop. Right? So it's making ATP. It's still going up so it's making ATP. It's still going up so it makes ATP. And then here it starts to drop. And now we have ADP and AMP. And what that means is that it's used all of its carbohydrates. There's no more of those carbohydrates left to use anaerobically. So this is called anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis. And this 
is also not using any oxygen. So the ATP PCC system is not using oxygen and the anaerobic glycolysis is not using oxygen as well. And we'll say that the anaerobic glycolysis system, we'll say this goes for about 15 to 30 seconds. So I'm going to say 15 to 30 seconds. Okay. And again, it really kind of depends on intensity. So uh, I'm going to stop there and go back to the slides and we'll just kind of keep building on this and keep adding to it. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the aerobic and the anaerobic glycolysis. And this is um, essentially a metabolic fork in the road. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to draw a fork, right? I want you to think of a metabolic fork. And what this means is that when I switch from aerobic, I'm sorry, from anaerobic, to aerobic glycolysis, this is when I start to incorporate oxygen. So I'm drawing this line right down here to separate these two pathways. Okay, this one is without oxygen and this one is with oxygen. And what has to happen usually from here to here is either the athlete has to stop and rest because the intensity of exercise was so high and that's what we kind of get with this ATP, PC, and the anaerobic glycolysis system. This is usually short intensity, high duration exercise, right? High intensity, short duration exercise. That is these three pathways. Now, when I move into the aerobic glycolysis, intensity generally drops and duration increases, which is why we need oxygen. Okay? So this anaerobic glycolysis usually lasts for about 15 to 30 seconds and let's talk a little bit about it. So when we're talking about anaerobic glycolysis we're still talking about no oxygen okay and this provides rapid energy without oxygen for high intensity exercise about 15 to 30 seconds up to two minutes that's if the intensity is pretty low. Um, so what happens is glucose is going to enter the muscle Right? We already used our ATP and our PC system, which means now we got to start getting glucose from the liver or glucose that's already inside of the skeletal muscle. And glucose is going to go through some alterations. Enzymes are going to change it. It'll change it to fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Enzymes are going to change it a little more. It'll then be glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And then enzymes are going to change it a little more. And ultimately, we get pyruvate. And pyruvate is going to have two fates. One fate, if exercise intensity remains high, is that we will turn pyruvate into lactate. And with lactate, we will start to feel the burning in the muscles. Or if exercise intensity drops and we start to do slower, lower intensity, then pyruvate will go to the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, it will get converted to a TP. All right, so pyruvate has two fates. And on the next slide, it's going to kind of show you that with a, a little more uh, a little more detail. So let me come over here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. And let's go to the next slide. So we're still talking about the anaerobic glycolysis system. And we can see here that glucose comes from carbohydrates. So we'll get carbohydrates that will be broken down into glucose. Glucose will get converted to pyruvate. I just showed you that on the last slide. And pyruvate has one or two fates, right? This is that fork in the road. Pyruvate will get converted to lactic acid or lactate if exercise is high intensity. I'm going to write H, I, right? And we know it's high intensity and we know there's lactate because this is where we start to feel burning in the muscle. So if you've ever done any sort of exercise, you're like, oh my gosh, my legs are burning. Well, one of the reasons your legs are burning is because you're generating this byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis. Now, the other way pyruvate can go is if we lower the intensity, I'm just going to put Li for low intensity, then pyruvate will go to the mitochondria right here. And in the mitochondria, it will take pyruvate and it will take ADP and turn it into ATP. Okay, 
So if we have pyruvate being turned into lactate, we don't really get any energy from it. Lactate can go to the liver and be converted into energy, but there's no immediate energy. Where if pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, well, then we get a lot of ATP, but that is aerobic. And we know it's aerobic because we're talking about the mitochondria, and the mitochondria needs oxygen. So I hope that makes sense. And this is just an analogy that you can read that talks about anaerobic glycolysis. I will let you guys read that so I'm not doing a two-hour lecture here. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and we're going to draw for a second. Okay, I'm going to go back to the drawing, so just hold tight. So we're back to our drawing now, and we've talked about, again, let's just refresh our memory here, so let's make sure we understand all of these pathways that we're talking about. Um, let me go back to this one. So we have our um, ATPPC system, and we know that's for high intensity. I'm just going to put HI, high intensity, short duration exercise. And when we use that, uh, when we use that after about 10 seconds, we then shift into this pathway over here, which we call anaerobic glycolysis, right? And that's right down here. And we know that anaerobic glycolysis is also for high intensity, short duration exercise. Well, what did we just learn um, about anaerobic glycolysis in the last slide? Let me kind of zoom in a little bit here. We know that with anaerobic glycolysis, we will have glucose that will get converted into pyruvate. And pyruvate, if we stay at a high intensity exercise, pyruvate will get converted to lactate. And we know that lactate will start to feel some of that burning, right? And we also know that this glucose is coming from carbohydrates. So when we have anaerobic glycolysis, we have no oxygen. We have high intensity, short duration exercise. We're using carbohydrates and carbohydrates are being converted to glucose. And that's how we're making this ATP during exercise in that position. Now, I also said there's this kind of metabolic fork in the road, which means Somewhere about here, we are either going to have to stop exercising or we are going to have to reduce the intensity. And what happens there is, well, ultimately, we have aerobic glycolysis that's kind of building up here in the background, and it's going to rise up, and it's going to fall. And all the while, just like the other ones, it's making ATP, and it's making ATP, and it's making ATP, and it's making ATP, and then it will start to make ADP, and then it will start to make AMP, okay? So now the difference between these two glycolysis systems is that this one is using oxygen. We call this aerobic glycolysis. And that means that glucose is coming into the cell, it's getting turned into pyruvate, and pyruvate is going to the mitochondria with oxygen, I'll put O2, to make lots of ATP. And the difference between anaerobic and aerobic is again, anaerobic glycolysis is not using oxygen, and aerobic glycolysis is using oxygen. Now, the thing with aerobic glycolysis is this could be anywhere from, let's say, 60, I'm sorry, 30 to 90 seconds, okay? So aerobic glycolysis could be 30 to 90. So here we have ATP, PC, about 10 seconds. Of energy. And then we move into anaerobic glycolysis. And that is anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds of energy. 
and then we move into aerobic glycolysis. And that is anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds of energy. Okay, so those are the pathways so far, and it's really, really important that you understand them. So let's go back to the lecture now. Okay, so now that we're back from the drawing, um, we're going to talk about one more energy system, and then I'm going to stop this video. Um, we're not going to talk about aerobic metabolism just yet, um, but we are going to talk about the aerobic glycolysis. Now again, uh, we talk about that fork in the road. This energy pathway is allowing us to use oxygen, and since it's still glycolysis, we're talking about glucose. We're still talking about sugar. So this pathway means that we're going to send sugar into the mitochondria to be converted to um, ATP. Now, one of the things I want to change here is I want to change this to 90 seconds. That is not right. We're going to say 90 seconds here, okay? And I know this says 30 to 60 seconds, but it goes pretty long. So we're going to say 90 seconds. Um, and that will tell me who has watched the video and who hasn't watched the video. So for aerobic glycolysis, this is exercise that we use when oxygen is readily available. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to this, when we use this pathway, oxygen has not been made readily available to the contracting skeletal muscles. It's in the body, but all of your muscles are contracting, which means we need a lot more of it. So oxygen is not readily available when we use this system. We're still trying to deliver oxygen to the muscles and the amount of oxygen that it needs. When we shift into this pathway, oxygen is still not readily available. But when we get to that metabolic fork in the road and we move into aerobic glycolysis, now oxygen is available. And because oxygen is available, the intensity of exercise has to drop. All right? Um, so this is saying that oxygen is readily available. And this pathway involves the breakdown of glucose to produce energy in the presence of oxygen. So let's look at this. We have, um, we have glucose in the blood. And glucose is going to leave the blood. And it's going to enter the muscle cell. Now the muscle's contracting, right? So the muscle is using ATP. And then that glucose is going to get broken up into different sort of variations of glucose by some enzymes and then we're going to get pyruvate. Now here, if we decrease the intensity of exercise, we start running at a slower pace. That pyruvate goes into the mitochondria and it makes a whole bunch of ATP. Now if we don't slow down that intensity, pyruvate will get turned into lactate and lactate will build up. And if lactate builds up, we'll feel burning and that will shut the muscle down and we have to stop exercising. So we have a choice to make when we start to feel that burning. Do we keep going and just shut the muscle down? Or do we drop the intensity and slow down uh, so that pyruvate can go to the mitochondria? So this energy production is much more sustained. We can use it for a longer period of time, which if you go back here, uh, if we go really slow on, or really low on intensity, we can make this last even longer. Right? But this is the gateway into aerobic metabolism, which we can use for hours. Right, So we have to use this gateway to get into that aerobic metabolism. Um, so when we're, using, uh, when we're doing exercise like jogging or running or rowing, uh, we're creating ATP very efficiently by turning pyruvate into the mitochondria to make so many ATP molecules, right? And, and if we reduce that intensity, like I said, we, we kind of resist the buildup of lactic acid, right? This lactate won't build up and start burning the muscles. Um, so this is another one of those energy systems that aerobic uh, endurance athletes use. Um, and I'm just kind of showing you how Here's that metabolic fork again. If we increase intensity, we go to lactate. If we decrease intensity, we go to pyruvate. And you've all been there. You've all been either jogging and just you feel your legs. You're like, oh man, I got to slow down. It's, it's my legs are starting to burn, right? Well, that's because the that's because of the energy that you're using. So um, keep that in mind. And then this is just another short analogy for you um, about aerobic glycolysis. If it's still not making sense. 
So I'm going to stop there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one more short little video that talks about the segue from aerobic glycolysis to aerobic metabolism, where we're moving from carbohydrates, CHO, to fats. Okay? And then we will pick up on this uh, in one more short video. I just I don't want to overwhelm you too much. Uh, this is pretty heavy stuff. Uh, and I will be back with you guys shortly to get this video completed, and then we will take a test. I will talk to you guys soon.